You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig, and I direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. My guest today is Dr. Emily Mayhew, a historian of medicine at Imperial College London. Emily specializes in the study of severe casualty, its infliction, its treatment, and long-term outcomes in the 20th and 21st century. Recently, she's worked particularly closely with researchers and staff at the Royal British Legion Center for Blast Injury Studies, based at Imperial College. And she's part of the team that put together the groundbreaking Pediatric Blast Injury Field Manual. We're going to be talking a bit about her research into the impact of conflict on children, but we're going to start by diving into her study of wounded soldiers from World War I to the present day, because the ways in which soldiers' wounds have been treated and viewed has a huge impact on how we visualise war itself. So Emily, many thanks for making time to talk to me today. Welcome to the Visualising War podcast. Alice, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Can you kick us off by telling our listeners what sparked your interest in war wounds in the first place? How did you end up focusing your research on that? But it's a really personal element to my life. My grandmother was a nurse at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead. And I grew up knowing the story of the burned RAF personnel who she would treated there. And they were a very particular patient cohort, and it had clearly been the most important thing in her life. I grew up near the hospital itself. If you're a Sussex school child, you know the story of the guinea pigs. And when I started to do my research, when I started to think about what was primarily history of technology, I was interested in aircraft engine design. I was disappointed to see that this wasn't necessarily a story that people knew or that they took particularly seriously in the academic setting. So what I wanted to do was to take this very personal context, very personal part of my family history, and put it in an academic context and see what happened when I did that. And that was really where I became a historian of wounds. Right, that's very interesting. So the stories that you grew up with, your grandmother's experiences, have inspired your research. And you've gone on to write a lot on this topic, so not just on the guinea pig club, which we'll come on to in a bit, but you've particularly written a trilogy of books that take us from World War One all the way through to the conflict in Afghanistan. So I wonder if we could dive first into the World War One book, which is called Wounded, The Long Journey Home from the Great War. Maybe you could give listeners just a quick introduction to the stories of wounding and wounds that you tell in that book. So I always start with the First World War, because if you're thinking about modern military medicine, actually, if you're thinking about modern medicine, the First World War is really important. And it's really important because of the key phrase I put in the title, this idea of the long journey home. I'm not using that metaphorically. That's not a symbol. Getting people from the point of wounding to the various places they need to be where their lives can be saved is extraordinarily difficult, technically very demanding on both the patient and the caregiver, whatever their role. And it's something that we only really started to pay attention to in the First World War, in the Great War. So the idea that a very badly wounded soldier was picked up in no man's land or the trench where he'd been blown up and he was kept alive until he got to the field hospital. That was a specialisation that simply didn't exist before. And it was the First World War that really made the case for something that we'd recognise today as paramedics, uh, as people coming in an ambulance, as a life being saved at the point of wounding or the point of injury, not waiting until it got to hospital. So it's that idea of the journey. We would call it CASAVAC today, casualty evacuation. But the idea that the paramedics were in fact stretcher bearers in the First World War saved someone's life before they started to move them and made a series of really important decisions about who they were going to treat and who they were going to leave, what kind of pain medication they were going to give, how they kept the patient alive psychologically as much as physiologically. This was an entirely new way of thinking about life-saving and about wounding. And it's a transformation in the space of wounding that we see first at the First World War. That's very interesting. So a transformation also in medicine, you suggested, is that partly to do with the volume of wounded soldiers 
or is it to do with the kinds of wounds that they were getting? In both cases, that's true. The First World War on the Western Front, it's different everywhere else, and so you don't see the same survival rates. But because we know about the no man's land and the static battlefield that doesn't really go anywhere for four years, we have very large numbers of people injured. They're injured primarily by artillery weapons, so they have big holes blown in them, and they don't necessarily die, at least not immediately. And it requires a huge response, and that response goes on and on. And we learn this throughout the wars. If you do something regularly enough, for long enough, you get very good at it. And what they became was very, very good at ensuring that the point of wounding stayed the point of survival. And so what develops there is really a new expertise, is really this idea of, of paramedicine. I think the point that I wanted to draw out in Wounded is that these were the very first people anywhere in the world, the British stretch of Aerocore, who were trained to control hemorrhage, to stop a bleed and didn't have a medical degree. Prior to that, it was thought only doctors could do it. But after that, it was realised that anyone could stop a bleed, could control hemorrhage. And if they could do that, then they'd gone a good long way towards saving a life. It's that kind of detail that I wanted to get at at Wounded and to convey to people what, how important for horrible years that was. Yeah, so a hugely interesting chapter in the history of medicine, a revolution almost. And I think you mentioned that it's almost the static nature of that no man's land that allows, I suppose, an established set up clearing stations, as they were called casualty clearing stations, and, and a whole system to grow around it. Emily, what do you think people's cultural memory of wounding in First World War is? You know, growing up, going through school and so on, you hear a lot about shell shock. So you hear a lot about the sort of psychological injury. But I've never really heard much of the history of the physical injury. Is my experience typical? And, and why might that be? I think your experience is typical. I think that the First World War on the Western Front, as it relates to, to Britain, it's different for other countries, but as it relates to Britain, has had this very particular kind of branding done by the war poets that it wasn't their intention to, to dominate how we understood it, but it's become about existential human suffering. It's it stopped becoming about physical suffering. It's become about I invisible things. Um, quite often people say to me in the terrible effects of gas, gas was terrifying at the time and for people who survived it, it could leave them with lifelong problems. But it was three to five percent of casualties. Sixty five percent of casualties had suffered from an artillery explosion, had had a big hole blown in them. And we know it was about 44 to 45,000 people who lost one limb, two limb or even three limbs. People didn't write poems about them. The people who saved their lives, the stretcher bearers, were not people who had been at medical school. They hadn't been educated. They didn't write great books. They didn't paint great pictures. They didn't write beautiful poems. There are some lovely poems about stretcher bearers, really beautiful poems, and they're in Wounded. I've listed all of them. I've listed the art that was done of them. But because they don't have that, that, that really extraordinary level of dramatic and linguistic capability that the war poets had, they've gotten left behind. So one of the things that I wanted to write about in Wounded was really to put people back in the picture. I always think when I watched Blackadder, I always think there was never a stretcher bearer in Blackadder. But by, 90, by the time they had the film 1917, there are lots of stretcher bearers. And really importantly, if you go back and look at that extraordinary piece of filmmaking, lots and lots of stretchers. I was very happy to see that. That's really interesting, that sort of evolution. And it tells us a lot, I think, about our habits of visualising individual wars, war more generally, the selective nature of it and the kind of the socio-educational, the socio-cultural factors that, that work towards that. You've talked a little bit about these sort of artillery shells, the hemorrhaging, the, the advances in medicine on the field of battle that people without a medical degree managed to effect. I think you've said in the past that show me a wound and I can tell you the war it came from. And you, you implied that it's mainly artillery injuries that come from World War I. Is that right? So it's partly actually being struck by a shell, shrapnel and all sorts of other things too? Exactly. It's basically pieces of metal that hit you very hard. So whether it's a bullet, whether it's from a high velocity rifle, a machine gun, a shell fragment or artillery weapon. These are pieces of metal that hit the human body very hard go in very deep and I'm at the Blast Injury Study Centre as you kindly mentioned earlier and they carry a certain amount of energy into the into the body that's being impacted that does damage beyond the actual 
hole that's been blown in them. So the energy of the weapon carries on doing damage even after the weapons fragment has stopped. I think in a way this links in with thinking about that the war poets have branded the nature of suffering in war. You have to really think about what's not there. One of the things that's not there is a population that is a 19th century population that hasn't had vaccinations and inoculation, that has all their teeth. This is a much generally healthier population that comes to fight the war. So they're not catching diseases. They aren't, for instance, going to get tetanus. They are going to get other infections from the big holes that are blown in them. But they aren't going to get the things that would have brought them down had they been at wars in them that would have brought them down in the 19th century. They're healthy young men and it is the wound that stops them. So when I look at the wounds of the First World War, that's one of the first things that it tells me. Firstly, that these people are in good physical shape. So the medical system back home is working very well. And the next thing it tells me is that this isn't a ground war. This is not a wound. This is not a war that has aircraft yet. This is a war where both sides are flinging large bits of heavy metal at each other. And that's what will determine their strategy and tactics. And as we see the numbers mount up from 1914 to 1916 and what become these massive uh, battles of attrition, that the strategy and tactics of attrition makes itself felt all too plain when you look at the wound. And you use that word attrition that resonates with something that one of our other podcast guests has talked about, a a documentary maker in our previous episode, talking about the fact that people don't actually want to watch World War One in documentaries. It's not as entertaining, that would be the word he would use, as World War Two, but partly because it's so grim, there is so much attrition. And I suppose that also perhaps explains why there wasn't poetry written about these terrible wounds, because there's there's a certain amount of horror and gruesomeness that artists, that poets and so on really don't particularly want to convey. You mentioned aircraft there, Emily. So you've just given us an amazing introduction to how understanding the wounds of World War I helps us understand a bit more about medical history, but a bit more about World War I as well. But your mention of aircraft brings us on to World War II and to your book, The Guinea Pig Club, which was focused around, in particular, the injuries that were sustained by fighter pilots during World War II. So again, can you give our listeners just a quick overview of what you talk about in that book? So the guinea pig club has something in common with the patients that I write about in Wounded from the First World War. They are as well unexpected survivors, but they're unexpected survivors of a completely different kind of wound to those from the First World War. They're unexpected survivors from aircraft crashes, but in particular aircraft that explode in midair and where they are as a consequence very badly burned in the exposed areas of their body and 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 the surgeon will tell you these are what we call the highly functional areas so they're burned on their face and they're burned on their hands and so it tells us firstly that this is a wound that is inflicted when you fly an aircraft and it also tells you that it's inflicted by an aircraft with a great deal of chemicals in its petrol tank it's therefore a fighter aircraft it's a wonderful uh, emblematic spitfires and hurricanes which are in fact really dangerous little creatures to fly because if they are hit by a single bullet, their their fuel tanks that are in the front explode and the the flames rush through uh, the, the cockpit and burn the pilot very badly. Although they don't burn him very deeply, jets haven't been invented at that point, but it's almost like a jet flame. The flames rush over, do the damage, and then the flames are often out. And the pilot has to negotiate their way down somewhere, whether it's the sea or the ground, and hope that help will come. And it's those pilots who were most seriously burned that were brought specifically to one hospital, the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, and were treated there by one particular surgeon and his medical team. And again, with resonance back to the First World War, this ends up being about 5,000 individual cases. And the hospital gets really good at dealing with this particular kind of wound. So, uh, you know, another chapter in the history of medicine that's sparked by conflict and by this sort of sudden influx of young, healthy casualties with absolutely life changing wounds. And the RAF made some interesting decisions about treating these pilots, didn't they? So in the First World War, injured soldiers, when they were brought back to the UK for ongoing treatment, they wore hospital blues. They were generally kept inside, slightly out of sight. I think you've said in the past that 
bells rang when the hospital inmates, as it were, came out so that people of a sensitive disposition could sort of go indoors or look away. But the RAF decided to take a different approach to these fighter pilots who had these life-changing wounds, these horrific burns on their hands and the face. Can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. So the RAF is, it's aircraft. It's the new technological service. Firstly, it's very important to understand that the RAF is an independent service. It's not part of the other two. If the other two need planes, they have to go and ask very nicely. RAF will lend them some planes for their efforts because the RAF makes its own decisions. And it's determined to create a culture around the service that is different from the other ones, different from the older, more traditional services. And one of the ways that it's enabled to do this very quickly, right from the Battle of Britain onwards, is by the way that it treats its casualties. So the first thing it does is it acknowledges its casualties very public. It talks about the physical demands that flying aircraft makes on its aircrew and the risks they are from these terrible burns injuries. And when a bureaucrat sends the first lot of hospital blues down to the Queen Victoria Hospital at East Grinstead, they are dispatched forthwith and they're told, our pilots won't be wearing these, they'll be wearing their uniforms because whilst they are being treated, they are still in service. They're not medically discharged and we would like them back. And they publicly acknowledged what is really a very problematic injury. The public could look at a pilot who's got a burned face and a burned hand. But it might be assumed that they are going to find this too difficult to deal with. But the RAF challenges them by saying this is the face of the war and you need to understand what it is that we are doing as a service and our service personnel are doing for the sake of your freedom. And how do you think that visibility, that decision to talk publicly about the wounds, about the risks, to have them on display and say this is the face of the war, what difference do you think that made to people's perceptions of World War II, to people's um, cultural memory of it or understanding of it or attitude to it? Every one of my grandmother and in fact of my mother's generation knew who the guinea pig club were because by 1944 they weren't just famous in the local area, they were coming to London for receptions, they were coming for film openings and it was considered, your, your event was not considered to be properly um, authoritative unless there was a guinea pig club member showing the signs of the war with his uniform. So they had a tremendous impact. The public embraced the understanding, the reading that the RAF wanted them to make of these wounds very quickly. And it's a really good example when we think about it today. Occasionally I hear stories where People have written into the BBC saying they don't want to see a disabled presenter because it upsets their children. Well, the indication from history is that that isn't actually the case. It's probably the children who are not upset at all. Children, I generally find, handle this sort of thing much better than grown-ups. And if grown-ups can just be made to listen and be thoughtful for a very short space of time, then they can also adjust to this different reality of a physical human being. So I think that the legacy within the war it meant that the public could read a wound, but it also gives us a real best case scenario for how you approach numbers of disability in your midst and evidence that the public can adjust very quickly with very little explanation and that we can all move forward. Yeah, as you say, a very interesting social experiment almost that you, you can refer back to. And, you know, this decision to make these fighter pilots almost celebrities um, is, is really fascinating because it contrasts so much with the experience of an injured soldier coming out of earlier wars where society tended to turn its back on them somewhat. You know, there's, there's not that sort of safety net, that's not that public celebration you know, you might find yourself homeless, you might find yourself out of a job and destitute on the streets rather than fated by the public and by institutions. I think that's absolutely the case. And, and what was really particularly enlightened by the RAF in this period is to say that we will create something for which there is no precedent. We will not allow these people to be discharged and forgotten. In fact, if they are able to fly, they will continue to fly. And again, if you look at the wound, you know the war. One of the things that's most important in the Second World War is that we're always short of pilots. We're not short of aircraft. Everybody thinks we're short of Spitfires. We're really not. What we're short of is trained pilots. And if a pilot can pass his test, whether his hands are, are badly damaged or his face looks destroyed, then the essence of him, the importance of him is his capability to fly the aircraft and keep fighting the war. And the RAF recognises that above all else. What is it people are capable of doing? It's a very new message and it's never gone out of style or relevance as far as I'm concerned. 
So I'm partly wondering, following up on that, whether there was two strands to the public response. So there's this emergence of the sort of particularly honourable wound, the iconic wound, I suppose, of World War II, these burnt faces, burnt hands, and, and the emergence of these pilots as celebrities, which helped their integration back into society. But do you think that talking publicly about these wounds, that being honest about the horrors of being burnt like that, do you think that actually caused fewer people to sign up as fighter pilots or did it inspire them you know did the sort of the honorable wound turn these people into heroes enough to motivate some people to take that risk I think what we have to remember in the second world war particularly again on the UK mainland is the sense of emergency for a long time I would certainly say until mid-1943 there was this sense that we could lose the war and at East Grinstead at the hospital where they were being treated there were dogfights over the hospital surgeons and medical teams remembered that they were operating on burned pilots and cartridge shells would fall on the roof from aircraft flying overhead so there's a very real sense of emergency and I think they wanted to fly these iconic aircraft for a very long time this was really how you engaged with the war the army was in barracks for a long time apart from the army in North Africa and once the planning for Overlord got going, the RAF was the most direct way that you could be seen to be fighting the war. There was an understanding of, this, of the sacrifice it meant. It was also more modern from the point of view that it wasn't a long family history of battalions. It wasn't that my family has always been in the Grenadiers, therefore I'll join the Grenadiers. It was the new technological service. You could go and learn, you could be an engineer, you could have a technical education and you could join the RAF. That was what was required. You didn't have to have been to a private school. You had to be technologically skilled enough. So it was very much the new service for a new kind of war in a new age. And I think from the public point of view, it was difficult to engage with the war directly. Everybody did the best they could. They'd sent their saucepans to be made into spitfires. They weren't made into spitfires. But engaging with the guinea pig club, understanding their story became an important way for people to say, I too am engaging with the war in perhaps the only way I'm able, but I'm doing it wholeheartedly. So lots of things coming together there, then the sense that being in the RAF is actually more accessible to all sorts of people. It's not to do with your family tradition. Um, the fact that it's a way of it's the most visible way of being seen to be contributing in some kind of heroic way. And then the evolution, the way in which the public learned to read these wounds, perhaps carries on feeding into that and that sense that this is the ultimate potential act of heroism or potential act of sacrifice and service to your country. That's a long way, of course, from the wars that we fight today, which are not on our own soil and not overhead while we're operating in hospitals in East Grinstead. That brings us on to your third book, the third in the trilogy of wounded books called A Heavy Reckoning, which is about the war in Afghanistan. And we've had some great podcast guests already on, on the show who have talked to us about the very different kinds of wounds that started to become a hallmark of conflict in Afghanistan. So we had a dancer, Rosie Kay, who'd embedded with a, a rifles battalion, really looking at the impact of modern conflict on the human body. Harry Parker, who I think you know, was one of our other podcast guests who had life-changing wounds during Afghanistan after stepping on an IED. What Afghanistan has in common with the two world wars is this idea of the unexpected survivor, is that there are people who survive wounds that were expected to die and that therefore the medical system has to shift to accommodate them. It looks like the First World War because the wounds look very much like the First World War. These are artillery wounds. It's blast injury. By the time we get to the war in Afghanistan, we have a phrase for this and we call it blast injury. This is why I work in the Centre for Blast Injury Studies. And we have this absolute understanding that you have both the physical impact of the piece of shell or the IED or the rocket propelled grenade, whatever it is. And that is fired with such energy that that blast wave goes on through and does damage to the human body at the genetic levels, at invisible levels. So we now know that blast injury is a considerable hindrance to the proper healing of both soft and hard tissue. We just assumed it was the large piece of metal, but actually it's the energy that the large piece of metal goes on transmitting after it's stopped. It actually changes the genetics of the tissue of the person who is wounded. And one of the things that we look at with the wounded in Afghanistan is we can now understand what happened in the First World War so much more because it's a very similar kind of injury. But of course, the scale is significantly different. It's several thousand people of UK service personnel that are injured, as opposed to the tens and hundreds of thousands that are injured in the First World War. 
But we also have people who are injured. The war in Afghanistan went on for a very long, non-lesson learning, lengthy period of time. Although we didn't have the scale, although we didn't have the, the, the kind of landscape that was hacked out of Europe by the First World War, what we did have was the time, again, to get really good at treating those wounds. And this is why you really need to focus on the wound, because nothing else will tell you that at that level of detail and complexity than studying the wound. So Emily, you made a really strong case there for why we actually, we need to pay much more attention. We need to bring wounds into our habits of visualizing individual wars and war more generally. You know, you've given us a really interesting history of wounding across a hundred years in that very, very short space of time. And a history of how that sort of revolutionized medicine along the way, but also revolutionized the ways in which people look at soldiers, at wars and so on. Your Wounded Trilogy focuses on solutions and the medical advances as on the wounds themselves. And again, you write a lot about solutions in your latest book, which is just out, The Four Horsemen and the Hope of a New Age. And in that book, you celebrate all sorts of different ways in which medical science, humanitarian organisations and other things really stand in the way of the Four Horsemen. So war, pestilence, famine and death. Your first chapter is about war, that first blood red horseman. And you begin it by telling the story of Henri Dunant, who witnessed the Battle of Solferino in 1859 during the Second War for Italian Independence. Now, you can tell the story much better than me, but perhaps you can explain to our listeners who he was, because not everyone will have heard of him, what he did and why you wanted to begin your book with, with his story. I, I hope I'm not a Pollyanna, but I do try to always come up with a solution. I sit in the Centre of Blast Injury Studies. We are actually within the Department of Bioengineering. And so I sit with scientists. I don't sit with other historians. I sit with scientists. And there's literally no point coming into a meeting if you haven't worked out how you're going to fix things. So my default, whilst I've been based in this department, has to be to talk about the problems, to talk about the issues, but to suggest solutions and, and to suggest a strategy for solutions that is viable. So that's what really being a historian in the science department has brought to me. And I've then gone back to look at the four really ancient dangers. Everybody knows who the horsemen are. Thank you for saying who they are, though. It's war, pestilence, famine and death. And I wanted to see how something very old has solutions in our time and how that plays out with how we understand our own world. So the first one, as you say, is war. And I really started to think about how have we held back war? How have we, how have we been able to mitigate its worst effects? And I identified this moment where we have what's really the, the birth of humanitarianism, organized humanitarianism, and it comes from one single person and one single book, and that doesn't normally happen. So this is an anomaly. Henri Dinant was a Swiss businessman who went, as they often did in the 19th century, to watch a battle. He went almost like he was going to an IMAX to see something really epic, to stand at a safe distance and watch a battle. And he's then going to do some business after the battle with the other people who've come there. And he finds that he is unable to remain neutral. He finds that as the battle ends, and it's sulfurino is particularly brutal, it's dreadful weather, there's no water, 55,000 people are left on the battlefield at the end of the first night, that he has to go down, he can't walk away, he can't go back to his house in Switzerland, and he has to go down and do the best that he can for the wounded. And the legend has it that he sets up a little white handkerchief with a red cross on it, and that this is the birth of the red cross. We're not sure that that's exactly what happened but we know that he takes off his jacket and he goes and works and then he goes to the nearby town of Solferino and he brings back volunteers and he puts them to work the next day with the, those survivors on the battlefield and those who've not survived the battle and they're doing the work that the International Committee of the Red Cross has done ever since. They're treating the wounded no matter what their uniform, they're communicating for the wounded, they're writing letters home, they're accounting for the dead, finding who has been killed, keeping lists, trying to find a way to let their families know that they've been killed, and then burying the dead in a respectful manner where their point of burial is marked. Although there is identifiably a humanitarian impulse before then, there isn't this organised impulse. What Dunant begins there with his team of volunteers will become the International Committee of the Red Cross within a decade, and it will have the Geneva Convention and the principles of neutrality underpinning it. 
And this changes the way that we fight wars because it puts a third presence on the battlefield, combatant and neutral third party who is there purely for the humans that are suffering. And that's what I wanted to draw out in my, in my war chapter, that this is the modern age of humanitarianism is also the modern age of war. There is a problem and brutality, and there is also something of a solution. So this third party, this person or, or organization or phenomenon that stands in the way of war then becomes a thread throughout the chapter. And I think it's such an extraordinary story that Henri Dunant went to watch a battle but couldn't stay disengaged. And out of that came, you know, he wrote a book, didn't he? A Memory of Solferino, which in itself helped trigger the International Committee for Relief to the Wounded, which then effectively became the Geneva Convention and the founding of the um, International Committee of the Red Cross which, you know, extraordinary, but your chapter one in, in your book, The Four Horsemen, then goes on to look at Mosul in 2016. And you talk about that as the end of an age, because in Mosul in 2016, the Red Cross declined to get involved. It was too dangerous. They couldn't put the people on the ground and guarantee their safety. So what then developed was a, you know, an incredible absence of medical care of that third party, that sort of neutral presence on the ground. And there was this desperate need for a humanitarian medical response. So can you explain what went wrong there and what, what the consequences of that was? I'm not sure that anything went wrong. I think we simply got to a point in, in the 21st century where we had to acknowledge that things have changed so much that we need a radical rethink. So Mosul is occupied by ISIS in the most bloody and brutal fashion imaginable. Almost immediately, an allied force of countries around the world led by the Iraqi government starts putting together a multinational coalition, which will eventually will liberate all the towns and cities that have been occupied by ISIS. Mosul is, is the most important as historians. I think we always think that having a history really counts for something. Mosul is the oldest occupied city left on earth. This is of the first cities that were built, Mosul is the one that is left. And you can see ancient ruins from its apartment walls. And that makes Mosul really very special when you're looking at it from a historian's point of view. So as the, they begin the liberation of Mosul, it is understood that probably a million citizens will flee the city because liberation sounds great. It's usually the bloodiest part of war and a million citizens will leave. And it is those citizens that will require not just medical care, primary medical care, so food and supplies and blankets and, and a place to sleep, but they will be wounded during the process of leaving the city because it was immensely dangerous and therefore they will need trauma care. The thing that the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, and a number of other humanitarian organizations have become the world specialists in the provision of. And when there is the expectation that there are going to be displaced, wounded civilians, it is assumed that it is those organizations that will meet their needs. There wasn't the facility within the coalition itself to deal with wounded, displaced civilians. And a lot of assumptions were made about who was going to come to Mosul, who was going to stand for these civilians, but they were poor assumptions. They were out of date. And so when the liberation started, the only way for humanitarians to remain safe, well, we will come to know this verb, for them to be embedded with the coalition forces. And this meant that if they were embedded with the coalition forces, they were no longer the third party on the battlefield, that you had combatant, combatant, and somebody with one of the competents. So it went against the genetics of the ICRC uh, that they, they could not be that. If they could not be the third party on the battlefield, if they could not establish that place of safety for their, their officers to work, then they would not come. And so they did the only thing they could do, which was decline to come to Mosul. That's a, a fascinating explanation. And, and so it left a gap, it left people wrestling with, well, what do you do next? There was developed then a sort of Mosul trauma response by a range of humanitarian groups. But were they all embedded on one side or another? Did these groups find a way back to being that third party on the ground, that in, into that neutral space? Or did that only happen after liberation? 
this is what makes Mosul so particularly interesting. And we await the response of the ICRC. They're the only people who can really characterize what went on. And, I, and I'm looking forward to seeing when they do finally and formally talk about this. What happens in the absence of the ICRC is that the World Health Organization, and we all know a great deal more about that now than we did 18 months ago, they're also what is known as the provider of last resort. So when no one is coming, the WHO will always come. And they will provide the best possible response to the crisis that they can give. They're used to providing responses in the case of natural disasters. So it tends to be things like earthquakes, where they're not going to require the specialist wound trauma care that would be offered by the ICRC, by Médecins Sans Frontières and by the other groups. But they come, they put out a call, and it's that call that the ICRC declines to meet. And then they put out a call to everyone they know, all the really small groups who are so small that they crowdfund, the really small trauma providing groups that exist around the world, that are working today, that have been everywhere, that go to small battles, that go to civil wars, that go to bomb blasts, that go to earthquakes, but don't go to anything as big as Mosul prior to Mosul. They put out a call for them to come along to Mosul and to become part of a non, what they eventually called a non-traditional coalition of small humanitarian groups. And so these groups gather together, the WHO coordinates them, and they start to meet the trauma needs of those fleeing Mosul. And this is the point that we need to pay attention to. They are definitely not neutral. In fact, one of them said to me, that's a quote, we are manifestly definitely not neutral. They got protection from the coalition. Uh, they were effectively embedded with it within the coalition against ISIS, and they were not a third party on the battlefield. But they were all there is, all there was. They were the only chance of survival for those people fleeing Mosul with bad wounds. And that's the point at which the first age of humanitarianism begun at Solferino ends. And now we need to work out what the second age is because it's much more complicated than the first. Absolutely, much more complicated now. There's not that assumption of neutrality. And I think one of the things that happens in your book, The Four Horsemen, is you imagine these horsemen always pushing for an opening, always pushing for an opening in this line of defence. And, and the fact that we always have to keep rearranging ourselves and shoring up the holes in the line. So this is a moment in time, essentially, you're calling our attention to where we need to think again about our lines of defence. One of the things that's interesting in this chapter about Mosul is that one of the characters in your line of defense is not a medical person, it's not a humanitarian organization, it is a historian. The chapter spends a lot of time reporting on the, the work of Mosulai, a historian and a journalist who for some time kept his identity secret because it wasn't safe to be reporting out of Mosul, wrote a blog, got the story out there of what was going on. That's really, really interesting. It, it ties in with some of the other discussions we've had with other podcast guests, for example, Tony Borden, the director of the Institute of War and Peace Reporting, who, who has also worked with Mosul I. this need for historians and journalists to be part of that line of defence. So what role do you think history or storytelling can play in standing up against the war as one of the horsemen? I think it has a really important role. I'm going to say that I'm a historian and I'm talking to a historian in, within the context of, of understanding war and understanding the histories of war. At Mosul in particular, you see this, you cannot untangle into the deep human past from the really current human present. So you have a historian, the Mosulai, who understands when Mosul was Nineveh, he understands what all the ruins are, he understands the importance of the tombs that were built in the 11th century and how they play out in Mosuli's life today. That's what he went to do his undergrad and his postgrad on, that was what he was going to teach at Mosul University, he was going to teach Ottoman history, Assyrian history, all of that, and he sits in the city occupied by ISIS, he keeps out of the way and he blogs, he does that most modern of communication forms. One of the things that I was really interested in was the detail that he gives. He's not seeking to make big strategic political points. 
He wants to tell us about where the checkpoints are. He wants to tell us what buildings have been destroyed at that point. He wants to give us the human detail as he experiences it on a day by day basis. And that made it really interesting for me. Where, where was there water? When was there no water? Um, when do women start disappearing? How do children get to school and what's going to happen when they get there? He's really giving a dispatch from the front line, but with that historical sense, because that's his job, but also he's in the most historical place on earth. And it's an absolutely unique viewpoint in history. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're choosing to, to draw attention to it here. I think it's that kind of human detail that I'm, I'm not sure if we haven't learned by now that war doesn't work. I don't know if we're ever going to do that. I've, if you're a medical historian, a military medical historian, it's like, yes, OK, I've been saying this for a long time now. This doesn't work. Don't do it anymore. It's expensive and painful. But perhaps if you can say these are the direct human consequences, whether it's somebody who can't find water, who just uses enough Wi-Fi to get his blog post out about the capture of the Yazidis while he's there, while, the, while he's in the city, or someone who is going to experience a lifetime of pain because of the iconic injury that they've had, but that they will live with forever, long after the public forgotten to read the injury. Perhaps it's that level of detail, of human detail, that historians, historians of wounds, and historians more broadly can provide so that we think before we act and before we engage in what is always a war of attrition. So it's, it comes down to storytelling in many, many different ways. What you're saying resonates with what some of the artists on the podcast have been talking about, their interest in representing the ordinary, the everyday, the small details, the pockets of peace in the midst of a long conflict like Iraq, for example. The importance of documenting all of that as part of the wider picture so that our focus isn't just on the sort of the short term injury, the instant blast, and then our focus goes off it. It's on the grass the everyday, the ongoing pain, the impact. It's really interesting to hear you talking about the role that storytelling can play in at least mitigating the impact of conflict potentially, potentially even preventing it. If people listen and read carefully enough, that might be a moment just to say, go and read Mosulai's blog posts. They really are eye-opening. Emily, you're a storyteller yourself. So I think one of the things that's striking about your history books is that you really do enjoy telling the stories of individual people and I'm really interested in your decision in the four horsemen to visualize war and famine and pestilence obviously in this very old this very iconic way but how do you think it helps us visualize war particularly in fresh as well as old ways by picturing war once again as this blood red horseman I think that was one of the things that surprised me. One, I'd made the decision to have the four horsemen because they allowed me to sort material that I was already interested in working on into these four categories. And I always say this, I say that I had them on my big sheet of A3 and I was putting in detail. And suddenly I realized there were hoof prints on a piece of paper that the four horsemen had, had somehow made their way into my office and then they just, just never left. It's like going back to Mosul, is that these are these very ancient symbols of human suffering. And they resonate down the ages. And when we're thinking about storytelling in war, it's never enough just to tell the story of our time. The chances are, if you go back, you'll find something very similar, whether it's from Homer, whether it's a classical historical source, whether it's looking at the history of sieges in, in medieval periods. There are things that remain and that are immensely powerful. I used the horseman because I wanted to access that, because I wanted to talk about something that was epic and it Really, when you're thinking about a symbol or a metaphor or an, a visual image, the older the better, the older the more epic. But also I wanted to talk about very ancient threats, these, these four very ancient threats. And I wanted to put the image of the blood red horsemen in people's mind's eye. So when they saw ISIS riding in on their Land Rovers into Mosul, into our most ancient city, with the black flags flying, I wanted them to see the horsemen amongst them that ISIS had opened up gaps that the horsemen could ride through and that they were thinking rich pickings here. Mosul's gonna be good for horsemen. And we think a lot about the news. We can scroll past the images of ISIS going into Mosul in their Land Rovers. But if we think about the horsemen riding amongst them, just slot them in. I think that makes us linger more and, and understand what's going on. And nothing does that. Nothing keeps people focused, like an image that's thousands of years old, that's been effective and meaningful for a thousand years. So it's really why the blood red horseman is, is so present. It's horsely, I, I wouldn't say it's equine, I don't want to say it's equine, but it's horsely. When people read this book, I want them to hear the hoofbeats 
all the way through and understand that just behind them at their shoulder, there is a very large ancient beast and we need to really pay attention. I think that it's such an effective strategy in the book. Absolutely, you do have this presence of this live animal that's sort of snorting and breathing hard and wanting to push through. And as you say, I think it's one of the things that's effective about it is that you're getting us to visualise war as a sort of an ancient, age-old threat. So we can't just look at what happens in Mosul as what's happening in Mosul and what happened in the First World War is what happened in the First World War. We have to link it together to our shared humanity. So as a strategy, it's really, really powerful. One of your other horsemen in Chapter 3 is famine. And I think one of the things that comes through in, in the book is the way in which all these horsemen are linked and that they work together. And, you know, you open up a line in your defence and it's not just one that will get through. Sometimes it's several of them. So when you talk about famine, you end up talking about war quite a bit because you talk about the great famine of our age, which is a man-made famine in Yemen, um, the result of war and of sieges, as well as other things. So you're, you're sort of branching out beyond what we typically recognise as wounds here, looking particularly at the impact of famine on the bodies and the cognitive as well as physical development of children. Can you just tell us a little bit about that, what your interest in shining a spotlight on children in particular, on these perhaps unseen victims of conflict? I think it was Mosul that really set me off on this path because I was looking at essentially wounded soldiers and then I was looking at wounded civilians. And then when I took a step further back to see what other horsemen were there, I could see that the Black Horseman of Famine was there. Um, but you could see the physical state that civilians were in from Mosul in addition to the wounds that they were suffering. So they were, going to, they were always going to need more than trauma care. They were going to need a great deal more care beyond that. And I wanted to see how war and famine interacted. I think we have in our head for the, the, the great famines of the 1990s, of, of these desolate areas of the world where we had to go in with huge sacks of grain and there, there were dead livestock all over the place. It was, we assumed it was down to a weather anomaly. Of course, it was always much more complicated than that. But the famines of the 20th century did have this element that there was weather in play. There were things that humans couldn't control in play. Famines in the 21st century look much more like famines from medieval times because they are entirely man-made. One of the things that distinguishes the modern famine, the 21st century famine, is that it's never, ever about an absence of food. It's about food being in a place where people can't get to it because they're besieged or there's a civil war uh, or they have no means of transport or they're terrified or they have no money and they have no money to buy the food and no prospect of earning money and they become dependent on aid that may not get through. So I wanted to really re-establish that link between war and famine that as being something both ancient and modern. This is where the horsemen are really helpful. Uh, if you go back to the great image of the horsemen made by Albrecht Dürer, they always ride together and they are based on, I think, uh, mercenary cavalrymen fighting in the Hundred Years' War. And they would go to a city and besiege it and grind it down to its bones. And we've seen the same thing happening in the 21st century. Cities are besieged, not by cavalry, but by mechanized infantry, by terrorist groups, whoever it is. And the cities and the people that live within them are ground down to their bones in exactly the same way. And so starvation becomes a result of war, not just wounds, but also starvation. There is a broader physical consequence. And what I really wanted to draw attention in this chapter was that it's children who pay the highest price of this of this different slight different wounding by other means, if you have it, wounding by other means, uh, generated by war, by human activity. We can recover from being starved. Adults will recover from being starved. We can get back uh, most of our, our cognitive development. We can get back our, our physiological and, and physical damage. We may go on suffering the psychological damage that almost certainly comes with being starved, but children don't. It's like ripping down the scaffolding on a building. If you're halfway to putting up a, a building and you rip down the scaffolding, then it may be very difficult to get that building completely rebuilt in the way that you wanted it originally to be. A starved child is a child whose bones will always be deficient, who may very well suffer cognitive deficiencies in addition to the psychological stresses that they've experienced not growing up. 
as, as it usually is in the kind of environment where you experience prolonged starv starvation and malnutrition. And it may not, again, it may not be when you say starvation, you think of a very, very thin child. It may simply be a child that lives for years with insufficient nutrition. So I wanted to bring back that link, that idea that you can grind a city down to its bones, whether you're in the 14th, 15th or 21st century, and where you're going to see those costs paid most heavily is in the children of what's left of that city. And again, this is when it comes back to you always look at the art, always look at the, the cultural sources, the horsemen that Dura engraved doesn't carry a, a sigh or, or some other symbol of dreadfulness. He carries a set of scales. He carries a set of scales because the food that you can buy is going to be much too expensive for most people that need to buy it. That the exchange that will be done will be deeply unfair. And it's usually the child that will pay the greatest cost. I think that comes across so clearly, not just in your third chapter um, on famine, but it also features in your first chapter on Mosul and war. Um, and I think you say at one point, conflict zones have two things in them, high explosives and hunger. And this toxic cocktail then of poor growth, malnutrition, immune dysfunction, cognitive impairment. And then you might add injury into the mix. You know, a child that's already malnourished might then end up being the victim also of an injury. We might come on to that in a second, but you've mentioned sieges a few times and, you know, I'm a, I'm a Roman historian, so I come across narratives of sieges every so often. And your book got me to go and look back at some of those narratives and how we've talked about sieges in the past and historically. And I realised that we talk about them in really high level strategic terms. So we talk about the sort of military operation where, you know, an enemy forces, um, enemy forces surround a town, they cut off a essential supplies and they're trying to get the people inside to surrender or it's talked about as a blockade so it's talked about in very technical terms there's often a focus on the on the assault um on on the airstrikes in the in the modern world um uh, the military operation the adult thinking and there isn't a discussion of well there's rarely a discussion of the civilians but no discussion of the children of the the sort of the wider knock-on effects you know this is really a quite an invisible wound in a sense as you say wounding by an, another form could we move on to blast injuries on children because you've obviously through world war one world war two the afghan conflict you've studied a lot of blast injuries in adults but i think you've said in the past that actually the highest number of blast injuries um, are um, have an impact on children so they affect children more than anyone else um, but do children get the same level of treatment the same Kazavak system the same medical um, infrastructure um, coming in to support them children don't they, they have a great global invisible cohort of blast injury uh, casualties of pediatric blast injuries kind of a phrase I never really wanted to use there's an assumption that what you do with grown-ups is also what you do with children it tends to be a very emergency point of wounding care based process. Children, their lives get saved. And I think we probably, um, if we have an understanding of children that are blown up, it's, it's a heroic surgeon, usually a Western surgeon coming in with a humanitarian organization and saving the child's life, bandaging up the limbs they may have lost with clean white bandages, a photograph is taken and everybody goes, phew, that's all right then. But it really isn't. I talk about the damaging of, of the infrastructure of children by malnutrition. And of course, BLAST is a much more effective and permanent way to destroy the infrastructure of a growing child. But anyone who has children know that they, they grow very fast and they have green stick fractures. Their bones are different from adults. When a child experiences BLAST injury, usually what happens is one or more of their growth plates, so the point on their bone which stimulates the growth of their limbs, is destroyed, which means that the limit that is not destroyed will go on growing as it should, but the other one won't. And the child is suddenly in a space where they're not growing as they should. Their bones are probably uh, are probably quite malnourished. They have very little mineralization, but they're not going to grow as they should. But they're not going to stop growing. They're just going to grow in an irregular manner. 
And what this is going to mean long after the humanitarian agency has left, the surgeon, the heroic surgeon has left, is that they're going to really struggle to get prosthetics. They're going to eventually give up on wearing prosthetics. They might get one prosthetic, but they won't get one in three months time when they need a new prosthetic because their leg has done a certain amount of growing and now one side of their body is higher than the other one. And this may mean that they're not able to go to school. And if they can't go to school, for girls in a lot of parts of the world, that means early marriage or forced marriage. And for boys, it means forced labor. So blast injury affects this, the global cohort. I think that Save the Children have calculated that currently in 2021, there are 300 million children who are at risk of blast injury. And that doesn't mean, of course, they all live in conflict zones, but many, many of them live in post-conflict zones. This is where we see most of the injuries occurring. It's children who can go out to play, who can go out to get a job, who can go out to school, move around in very large groups and pick up something shiny. They're injured as a group, as a family. And when they come into a hospital, there's five or six of them. That was rare in Afghanistan. When our military casualties came in, there were one or two. And if there was more than one or two, that was a very, very hard day at the office for the medics there. But for anybody dealing with blast injured children, it's often five, six or seven children whose lives and limbs need saving at the same time. So it, the conflict may be over. The siege may have been lifted. Things may be, well, probably not getting back to normal, but there may be a feeling of safety. But for 300 million children on our planet, there should be no feeling of safety because of the problem of legacy munitions. Now what we need to do is take everything we've learned on our military cohort. We know a lot about blast injury now and apply it where there is the most singular global need. And that's technically very challenging. That's a staggering number, 300 million and a very sobering number and absolutely something that we should be, you know, imagining horsemen about. Uh, and you, what, what you've just said, again, echoes things that many of our other podcast guests have said, which is that the images that we associate with war are often the sort of the instant, the short term. So as you say, a, a wounded child, but bandaged and, you know, the implication is on the road to recovery. But it's the it's the war that goes on long after troops have gone home, the war that goes on when the, the guns have stopped firing, which is less visible. But as you describe it, sometimes even more impactful in terms of the injury on civilians and, and children in particular. And that brings us on to other sort of ongoing trauma, I suppose. So both in children and in adult casualties, you do talk and research about the invisible injury, not just the challenge of outgrowing prosthetics, but you talked a little bit earlier about the, the damage at the genetic level and the chronic ongoing pain that, that, that blast injury survivors suffer long after, as you say, the public have learned to read their injury and remember it. Can you tell us a bit more about that? I think this comes back to the First World War and that great branding that was done by, by the war poets and by many of the, the people who, who suffered considerable psychological disorders, but were able to express those psychological disorders very well and very meaningfully. And that's become the great take home. The longest effect of war is psychological. And this is something that there are some very, very fine scholars who've worked on this. And you can go back to the earliest conceivable sources for, for, for psychological disorders. And it's a truly fascinating literature. There is, for a wound historian, something even more significant and to which we pay considerably less attention. And that is to chronic pain. What those of us who look at wounds know, and, we, and we're drawing this now from research into medical records from the First World War, is that a life lived with pain caused particularly by a blast injury is going to be a whole life lived with pain. There is survival and then there is life beyond survival. And the pain is not going away. There's a point at which acute pain, so pain that's very obviously from an injury and the treatment that that injury needs becomes chronic pain. And actually anyone who's had chronic pain for whatever reason, who's had chronic back pain or shoulder pain or hip pain, will know we don't have a great deal to offer in that space. You know, there's, there are medications and then when they don't work, there's, you know, yoga or breathing or mindfulness. Well, that's what 
we have to offer our our veterans anyone who lives with a blast injury for the rest of their lives they're going to suffer chronic pain and they're going to suffer phantom limb pain so where where the limb has gone where you still feel it this extraordinary phenomenon and again i think you can you can trace those invisible footprints all the way back through the classical sources of, of people who lose a limb and still feel pain in that limb and what we know for adults, we know almost nothing at all for children. We are extremely bad at pediatric pain. It's difficult to talk to children about the pain that they're experiencing. It's difficult for them to enunciate what they're going through. And eventually they stop being children and they move out of pediatrics and into adult care. And it's almost like much of what's been done has been scrubbed because I'm solution focused. There is a place where there's exemplary practice of so anybody suffering from sickle cell or those related conditions, which are not only chronic to deal with uh, physiologically, but extremely painful. The transition from pediatric to adult care in terms of pain management is really excellent within that space globally. So I always like to say, can we look at where this is well done? But how children experience pain after blast injury, how they then experience pain for the rest of their childhood and on into, the, into adulthood is very poorly understood. And the first thing we can do is recognize it. Good pain management, I was told by a very clever man who's in Afghanistan, always starts with a question. And in fact, it should always be a conversation where we ask a question about pain and then we listen to the answer. And whether that's now or whether that's us interrogating the sources, I think what we'll find is that as long as there have been horsemen, there has been pain and we have yet to really meet that challenge. And it's so it's about talking and asking questions and listening, uh, but then also perhaps putting it on the map a bit more with the kind of storytelling and research that you do. So Emily, in your research right from World War One all the way through to the 21st century, you've highlighted all sorts of amazing medical advances, humanitarian solutions, vaccinations get a huge plug in your book, The Four Horsemen, uh, but you also draw attention to the fact that there are still solutions to find that, for example, in Mosul, Mosul threw up this sort of humanitarian response crisis, which we still need to sort out and we need to kind of revise our systems and so on. So do you feel optimistic or pessimistic on the balance of things that that as we keep going through the 21st century, we're going to be keeping the four horsemen, particularly conflict, war at bay, that our lines of defences are strong or is it optimism or pessimism that you feel? I, I think I have to feel optimistic because otherwise, again, if I walk into a, a management meeting in bioengineering, I'll, I'll be in trouble for not coming in with a solution. I, I think I do. I think you look at points in human history, not where we've dealt with all four horsemen, but where we've dealt with one particularly well. I, I recently heard a former president of NSF talking about when the world wanted to deal with the Ebola crisis. Uh, and, the, and the world has wanted to deal with coronavirus. And whilst it, has, it may have felt like we've taken a very long time to get our act together, what's been achieved has been absolutely remarkable so we can do it when we try and we can point at examples of where global cooperation has worked and where a horseman uh, when the horsemen are never going to go back into their crack in the in the shell of the earth they're never going to say okay thanks mate we're retired now you know we can slip off our bridles for the rest of time they're never going to do that but we just need to push them back and we have examples of best practice and we can pay attention to those and we can be prepared to transpose what we learn there into other areas. The horsemen do their best work riding together and we do our best work to combat them when we work together. That sounds really obvious, but it's interdisciplinary work. If you're going to fix famine, you need to fix pestilence and ideally you need to hold back war and then you will make really significant strides. It's not like we don't know what to do. We, we do know what to do. We just need to do it a little better. And we need historians alongside medics and humanitarian organisations and uh, medical historians like you in particular. Emily, you've given us a really fascinating insight into the history of military wounds, what we can learn about war itself from studying not only the wounds, but public responses and medical responses to those wounds and how we can galvanise ourselves in the future 
by coming up with solutions that involve actually talking about these things, shining a spotlight on the invisible wounds, on the chronic pain, on the wounding that happens to potentially 300 million children after the troops have gone home. We need to be aware of all of that if we are, as you say, going to want to try and want to find solutions. So thank you so much for joining me today and giving us those insights, which have really shaped the way I'm going to look back on World War One, World War Two, and 21st century conflict as well. And I'm sure you'll have done the same for our listeners. Thank you very much for having me and also giving me the opportunity to focus on the storytelling side because it's the stories that we remember. We don't remember the technical stuff, but we remember stories from thousands of years ago. So it's so important for us to really shine a light on those and the impact that they can have going forward. Stories as interventions, even ancient stories are still interventions in the, in the modern especially world. Especially ancient stories. Yes, that's music to my ears as an ancient historian myself. So thank you, Emily, and thank you also to our listeners for joining us again. I hope you found this conversation with Dr. Emily Mayhew as fascinating as I have. Do keep tuning in to the Visualising War podcast. We have lots more fascinating episodes coming up. Next week, we're going to be looking again at some solutions-focused research. We're going to be talking to Dr. Frank Muller, who runs a project that brings researchers and artists together to explore the link between visual culture and peace. He's published books on peace art and peace photography and he believes that if you foreground images and pockets of peace in our depictions of conflict we can really shift mindsets and forge new paths to peace. So do join us for what promises to be another very interesting discussion. If you'd like to support our project please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And if you'd like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Visualising War or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at standandrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zofia Gertin. Thank you very much for listening.